Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, New Orleans. Yeah. I uh, wish that I could have brought with me some of that 85 degree weather. Yes. <laughs> that I left in West Palm Beach, Florida yesterday to come here. But I did the next best thing. I brought my beautiful wife. <laughs> and she is as warm as that 85 degrees. <laughs> Let me begin by thanking Dr. Dejega for seeing fit to approve me for the honor of serving as your closing speaker for this occasion. And especially let me thank my newfound sister and colleague in the struggle, Sister Hill, for having seen fit to select me to perform this service, this honored service. And to her able assistant, Sister Darlene Holmes, for putting the nuts and bolts together to enable it to happen. And to my other new frown friend and brother, Wes Johnson, <laughs> for having seen fit to recommend to Sister Hill that she considered me for this honor. And in his absence to my long-term friend and brother, Louis Ali from Baton Rouge, yeah. was with us last night, but he had to get back to work, for having suggested to Baba West that he might want to get to know this brother, <laughs> who seemed to be Baba West's alter ego and vice versa. <laughs> so we have certainly found each other. And I guess you could say that I am, or try to be, or want to be when I grow up, in West Palm Beach, what Baba West Johnson is in New Orleans. <laughs> A great man doing great work. For for an historically great people. And since we're talking about today, the topic is the change that black people need. That change essentially is that we need to change back to who we were before we were converted to what we have become. Before I get into that part of the talk, and I will end this talk with a formal speech. That's the way I keep things within the time frame, because otherwise you let a former preacher up here at a microphone and you turn him loose and he never know how to sit down. So I'm going to try not to do that to you this morning, but I want to try to be relevant, because that's what I believe that the sisters and brothers brought me here to try to do today. But there are several things that I want to ask you to consider doing. Number one, I am here on a mission. My mission is to promote a new initiative that I want all of you here to at least look into and explore. It is called the One Million Conscious Black Voters and Contributors Campaign. One Million Conscious Black Voters and Contributors campaign. And the way we intend to promote that campaign is by actually doing what we talk a lot about needing to be done, and that is economic empowerment. We're not looking, this is not a charitable activity, so we're not looking for donations or contributions. What we're looking to do is the same thing that Mr. Garvey and the UNIA did. They created and manufactured materials, goods, and provided services for which people paid. <coughs> Mr. Garvey didn't have a bank to go to to borrow the money to buy those ships. 
They had factories. They made the uniforms that the Universal African Legion and the Black Star Nurses wore. So what we're asking people to do to support and help finance this movement, to build a solid block of one million conscious, thinking black folk, is to purchase one at least, preferably more, of these shirts. And by doing so, you will help us to self-finance this movement. On the back of this t-shirt, it says, one of my favorite quotes from Mr. Gardner, the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. And so we put in our logo, in response to that, we got to organize, organize, organize. So my visit to you today is to recruit from among you those who fit the criteria of what we're looking for. And we're not just looking for any one million black folk. And let me put this in context for you. There was a time, many of the seasoned folk in the audience know this, when HBCUs and their athletic programs constituted, in actuality, the farm system for both the National Football League and the National Basketball Association. In other words, where most of their most outstanding athletes came from were from HBCUs, because in those days, black folks were not allowed to go to, especially not in the South, the so-called Division I colleges and universities. But the best athletes were produced in the HBCU program. They called them blue chip athletes. We lost that with integration, because then the Division I colleges and universities saw fit to strengthen their programs by recruiting the very best talent that we produce on our courts and fields of play. So now the best <coughs> programs for the, especially the revenue generating sports of football and basketball is played not in the HBCUs anymore, but in the Division I schools with the best programs, and those are the schools that have the wherewithal to recruit the best black athletes. So we provide, we provide the margin of victory for these schools and their programs in terms of those revenue generating sports. Keep that in mind. Similarly, to the extent that Division I colleges and universities, or the prestigious ones as they say, need to, in order to meet the federal government's so-called diversity quotas and requirements, have chosen to pursue the most outstanding black merit scholars coming out of high schools that they can get. In other words, if they're going to have to have some black students on those otherwise white campuses, they want only the best and the brightest students that we can produce. Makes sense from their standpoint, doesn't it? However, those sacrifices that we make by having the best and the brightest and the most accomplished that we produce ply their trade on behalf of the system that has historically oppressed us means that we are denied the skills, abilities, and experiences of those who are the best and brightest. We want to change that with this movement. So we're trying to recruit specifically one million, and one million incidentally is not just a figure we picked out of the sky. There are reportedly about 45 million black people in America. 2% of that would be about 900,000. So we rounded off the 900,000 to the next 100,000 because a million is a much easier figure to work with than 900,000. 
That's where the one billion came from. It represents then just about 2% of the total. And I'm here to admit to you that the 2% is an acknowledgement on the part of my colleague Jim Klingman and I that we're not likely to reach that 10% that W.E.B. Du Bois prophesied we would produce, and he called it the talented tenth, and that that talented tenth of us would provide the leadership necessary to uplift and advance the other 90%, and we would be carried forward and upward by the best and brightest that we produce. Well, what happens when the best, provide, best and brightest that we produce go to work for the system that denies us adequate progress and uplifting. We are obviously left to suffer the consequences. So we're making a specific effort with this initiative to recruit one million of the best and brightest folks that we have produced in this country who are willing to commit themselves to the uplift and advancement of our own people. That is absolutely necessary, my friends, because in the absence of doing that, we have become and are fast in the process of becoming even more so a permanent underclass in America, a class of people for whom there is no use in sustaining or furthering the interests of this country. We're already being replaced in many ways by so-called illegal immigrants who are being brought to this country. And let me share something with you that my wife and I discussed this morning. We were talking about the recent news that came out that even, now even some members of the Congressional Black Caucus have criticized your president because they say he does not care about HBCU. And I understand from something that I read and saw on the internet that the president did in fact say to them that either the HBCUs are going to have to cut the mustard or something to that effect, or they deserve to pass out of existence. Now keep in mind, this is the same president of yours who, about seven years ago, made the comment with respect to the bailout of Wall Street, because if you recall, there were people who opposed that bailout, who said that in America, a capitalist country, any business that could not survive on its own efforts is supposed to go out of business and be replaced by businesses that can make it cut the mustard, if you will. But on that occasion, your president said that those businesses, those Wall Street firms, those corporations, which were failing, were too big to be allowed to fail. So in other words, he would take the risk of losing political capital to save Wall Street but not to save historically black colleges and universities with their centuries of service to sustain and nurture black children to adulthood. So we need to understand that if we are to be saved as a people, we are going to have to save ourselves. consider joining and becoming one of the million, but only if you're willing to put in the work of uplifting and advancing our people. Unabashedly, unapologetically, I say to anybody that will listen, I am an unapologetic, unabashed, unrepentant black nationalist and pan-Africanist. 
and that if loving black folks is wrong, I don't even want to be right. That way, when you see me coming, you know what you got. I love black people. My commitment is to the uplift and advancement of black people. And I've been around too long now to let anybody tell me that to love my own people means in the, that, that by inference that I hate somebody else. No. I don't hate anybody. And that is a status in life that I'm proud to have achieved for this reason. There came a time when I came to understand that hating or even trying to hate does its most damage to the person doing the hating. Usually the person or the object of your attempts to hate has not a clue that you hate them or that you're trying. So obviously what you're trying to do to them has no effect on them. So this is not about hating anybody. It's about loving black people. Black people, we have to love ourselves. That's one of the changes that we have to deal with. So we ask you to visit our website. It is IamOneOfTheMillion.com. www.IamOneOfTheMillion.com. You can also send us emails at info at IamOneOfTheMillion.com. And please visit my website for background information about all of this. That's www.amafika.com, my first name, www.amafika.com. I've written a number of what I call black papers that explain a black nationalist Garveyite perspective on just about any subject or topic that is important to black people, whether we know it's important to us or not. So I invite you to visit that site. So now let's talk about moving from dependency back to self-reliance. In order to talk about any kind of change, we have to first give consideration to what is it that we want to change ourselves from, and what is it that we feel the need to change ourselves to. And how did we happen to come to be in the condition that we have deduced that we need to change ourselves from. And what would be more desirable about the condition that we're suggesting we need to change ourselves to? I submit that we began the process of becoming dependent when our ancestors were captured in different parts of Western and Central Africa and brought to this country in the holes of boats that were outfitted for that express purpose. You will never hear me say or debate the issue of when were the first slaves brought to America. Many black people engage in that discussion, in that debate. Some say 1619, when those 20 indentured servants were brought here. Some say 1555, when John Hawkins or John Knox or somebody brought some over, supposedly. Some others say 1557. Some others even say there were some slaves who came here with Leif Erikson back in the 12th century. I say, however, no slaves were ever brought to America. Let that sink in. No. Slaves were ever brought to America. Captives, human beings, were captured and brought here against their will, forced to give up their labor under circumstances that make it understandable that they would allow themselves to be abused and misused. But the simple act of forcing somebody to labor from sunup to sundown without any compensation does not in and of itself a slave make. You are simply a captive being forced to do work for which nobody sees fit to pay you. Right. 
You do not become a slave until you accept in your mind that that's what you are. We did not jump off the so-called slave ships calling these plantation owners massive. In fact, the first thing your ancestors and mine started doing when they were led off of those ships is looking for ways to run and escape. Because they didn't know the land, but they knew about escape. And many of them did. That's how we have maroon communities all throughout the Western Hemisphere. Those were our ancestors who were never conquered and turned into a slave. The process, or actually the conversion, of our ancestors into this creature called slave was a process that took somewhere between 60 and 80 years to complete, depending upon what part of the country and which state you were looking at, and perhaps six or eight generations of our people. And what they had to do, if you'll recall from your history, is there came a point when they stopped bringing new boatloads of captives over here from Africa. Because those people had not yet been conditioned or broken to the slave mentality that we have today. And so every time they were mixed in with those who were already there and were going through the seasoning process, they stirred up mischief and caused the people to start doing crazy things or things that were perceived by the slave owner or the plantation master to be crazy things. I want you to understand that this is important for us to know because when you tell our children that they are the descendants of slaves, you're telling them in effect that their history on earth began something less than 500 years ago. That's right. And that's as far back as they can trace their history. The very first human beings to be put on this earth by the creator who created it all were Africans. So how did our history begin just a little less than 500 years ago? We can't handicap our children by giving them reason to believe that that's the best that they've got to look back on and relate to. Is it any wonder why they don't want to deal with that? Because we're not teaching them to deal with it in its proper context. It took those many years and those many generations for these folk to breed a creature that could justifiably be labeled a slave. And the point at which they were successful was the point at which an individual who had been so conditioned accepted that that is in fact what he or she was. Let me associate that with you or uh, for you with something that you might be even more familiar with. Do you know, for example, that horses do not naturally take kindly to having a saddle put on their back and a human being jumping on there and going for a ride? <laughs> Nor do horses take kindly to being hitched up to a contraption called a plow and being forced to pull that contraption to turn some soil. Nor do horses take kindly to being hooked up to a wagon and being forced to pull this wagon full of whatever the people who hit me to it want to put on the wagon. No, the horse has to be broken to the saddle, or to the plow, or to the wagon. Now what does broken mean? It means that the horse's will to resist being subjected to this unnatural condition or situation has to be broken. His spirit has to be broken to the extent that he will accept the unnatural condition that he is being subjected to doesn't mean that he has come to enjoy having a ride or pulling a plow or pulling a wagon. It means that in order to avoid the pain that is inflicted upon certain parts of his anatomy, he will do as he is commanded to do. 
always hoping, however, that the next opportunity will present itself for him to make good his escape. But in the meantime, he will do what he has to do to avoid the pain, whether the pain is having that device, that piece of metal jerked in his mouth so that he has to turn to the right, or jerked in his mouth and he has to turn to the left, or he kicked with something called a spur in his private parts so that he has to jump and do what the person wants him to do. Do you think that horse enjoys that kind of abuse? <coughs> if you know that the horse didn't enjoy it, what makes you think that those human Africans enjoy what they were subjected to and they were treated the same way for the same purposes, to convert them into this creature that we came to know of as slaves? Now, what is it that you do to a human in order to turn them from a human being into a slave? Obviously, it's not that you destroy them physically because the purpose of the slaves supposedly was to give free labor. In order to labor, they had to be healthy enough to do what it was that the owners or the oppressors of them wanted them to do, right? So the change that had to take place had to take place in the mind. I used to do this with the children at our school. I would take a bottle, let's say, and take it out to the ocean, because we're close to the ocean anymore. And I'd fill it up with ocean water. And I'd bring it back to the school. And I'd ask the children, what's this? They said, a bottle of ocean water. But they knew where I got it. I said, now, if I want to change this, the contents of this bottle from ocean water to something else, what do I have to do with the ocean water? They say, you have to pour it out. I said, now then I'll have an empty vessel, right? Because I pour it out and I've got an empty bottle. So now what do we do? So well, now you can fill it up with whatever you want. <laughs> what these people did to our ancestors was to divest them of those traits and attributes which actually constituted their humanity. And once you had emptied the vessel, now you can begin to replace what you empty with whatever you want. That, in one way, it describes the process that was used to convert our ancestors from the human beings that they were when they were captured in various parts of Africa and brought here to the creature that was created as a result of the diabolical process of divesting them of their humanity and replacing it with a slave or plantation mentality. It's when the slave begins to answer to the name slave that he becomes a slave. Many of our ancestors to this day never succumb to being slaves. And I'm not just talking about the ones who escaped from slavery. I'm talking about even in the midst of what was going on, many of them never conceived. They accepted what they had to do, but always with the thought in mind, first opportunity I get, I'm up out of here. That's what we are descended from, not slaves. Now, what we need, obviously, is to reverse the condition where they use the process to convert humans into slaves. We can't expect that by events we can undo the effects that resulted from a process extending over 60, 80, 90 years and seven or eight generations by having events, not even great and wonderful events like the Million Man March. Those are good, but they cannot undo the effects of a process. Only another process that is designed specifically for the purposes of undoing the damage that was done by the previous process has even a snowball's chance in hell of undoing that damage and restoring us to the human beings that we used to be, that we must become again, and that I am convinced we are destined to reassume.
has to be arrived at by what the scientific community calls the scientific method. The scientific method, and for those of you who are educated, you already know this, but just bear with me. You ask a question. You do background research. You construct a hypothesis, or colloquially referred to as an educated guess. You test your hypothesis by doing an experiment. You analyze your data and draw a conclusion. Then you communicate your results, and of course you see what the feedback will be. This one million conscious black voters campaign is not just something that Jim Cleveland and I stumbled upon. We arrived at that concept based on our having applied the scientific method to the condition of black folk, with our thesis being that we got to change this nonsense. We've got to restore our people to who and what we were before we were converted into something else. And we think that at least 2%, 2 out of every 100, at least 2 out of every 100, have retained their humanity through it all. As the song used to say that we would sometimes sing in church, church, through it all, learn to trust in something, somebody. We have people who have survived with their mind, their humanity intact. And we need to find those folks in much the same way as if you took a magnet and you dragged that magnet through a pile of dirt. If there is any steel in the dirt, brother, it is going to stick to the magnet. And then you can lift the magnet up and with it will come any and all the steel that was in the pile of dirt. Similarly, in Florida, you see people all the time going down the beaches with a device, it's called a wand. And they have this wand and they're waving it over the sand. And every now and then you'll see them go and dig down in the sand. Why? Because that wand will detect any metal that is buried in the sand. So what we're doing with this movement, you can call that movement our magnet or our wand. When I come through here, I'm hoping to be a magnet in here. And when I leave here to go back home, I'm hoping I'm going to leave with some of you who have responded to my pitch and my recruitment effort to get you to become a part of this movement. We can do this, folks. If we can't do it, then the very thing that you all worship every Sunday when you go to church has got to be a lot. But see, my understanding of the God that created us is that it would not have given us more than we can make. Would not have put us in a situation or allowed us to put ourselves in a situation or to be put in a situation by anything or anyone else that we could not ultimately overcome. I'm here convinced that we not only can do that, but that we will do that, and that with the kind of folks who are gathered here today, and with the kind of leadership that has been exhibited here today, that we're in the process of undoing the effects of that previous process.